Hey everybody, this is John Bach back with another Discrete Time Linear Systems video. This video continues the infinite impulse response filtering story. Uh, so if you haven't seen the first video, pause this video, go back and watch the one on IIR filter design overview, uh, and then pick up again where you are right now, uh, and then we, you, can, you can follow along. Uh, in this filter, I'm going to talk about the four common IIR filters we use in Discrete Time. That's the Butterworth filter, Chebyshev type 1, Chebyshev type 2, and the elliptic filter. I give you some general idea of their characteristics, uh, and then I'm going to show you an example in MATLAB of designing a Butterworth filter using the MATLAB tools uh, to do that so you can, can see the, uh, the filter and how it works and, and how these different... Uh, then there'll be a follow-on video. I'll do a similar one for the Chebyshev type 2 filter, uh, just so you get a, a sense of those different how those different filters behave. Okay, so I'll switch over to the uh, whiteboard and, and talk about the different filters. Again, our topic tonight is designing IIR filters, and particularly uh, once we've gone over the over uh, the, the the general flavors of filters, I'll, we'll talk about how we do this in MATLAB. Again, the, the, what we're assuming is that we have some specification for filter that have been given to us or we've designed based on the problem. So instead of having this red ideal filter, we've recognized we're going to have some ripple plus or minus delta one around the ideal gain of one in the pass band. And again, I'm, I'm doing this for a low pass filter. It's very easy to map these same ideas onto a band pass or a stop, uh, a high pass filter or different filters like that. But we'll talk just to, to have a, a specific example. I'm, I've done the low pass filter here, right? So this delta one is the pass band ripple. Delta two is the stop band ripple. It says I'd like it to be zero, but I'll, I'll accept it if it's below delta two. And we often write those in terms of dB, R sub P and R sub S we'll use. Uh, for, for where those are in dB, how far away from the ideal they are. This in-between region between the pass band and stop band edges, omega P and omega S, is called the transition band. So as I said in the intro, there are four common filters, uh, and all these have a long history in continuous time filters. And as I explained in the previous video, we use the bilinear transformation to map them from dis continuous time filters to discrete time filters. Uh, the first one is called the Butterworth filter. Uh, the next one is the, called the Chebyshev type 1. And there's a Chebyshev type 2. And then there's the final filter is called an elliptic filter. And these uh, basically come down to different polynomials or ways to construct the polynomials for the filter. And, and it ultimately also comes down to different patterns of where they distribute the poles and zeros in the continuous time filter. The Butterworth is the simplest one, and you can find it in the continuous time part of the, the, uh, the Oppenheim and Wilski book we're using, in that it it's, puts its poles are all on a circle, and, and the width of the circle determines the pass band and stop band. Chebyshev's are elliptics in continuous time, are on ellipses, which is confusing because the elliptic filter or the elliptical filter is not the same as, as that, um, so it's more complicated that way. So maybe that wasn't the greatest name, but those are the names that history gave us. Uh, so we have to stick with them. Um, an, an interesting property is how they behave in the pass band and stop band. That the Butterworth filter is the smoothest filter. And so it has um, the... Uh, sorry for the, the short pause. I just realized I need to make a little more room. But the Butterworth filter is the smoothest filter. That it has the... Uh, the, the, the uh, steady smooth versions in the pass band and stop band. And then also, uh, the other thing we want to talk about is this idea of dispersion or nonlinear delay. To, to get, th to satisfy a given specification like, you know, something like the one shown here. If I fix delta 1, delta 2, omega p, and omega s of these four filters, not always, but usually the Butterworth is the highest order, but it also has the lowest dispersions. That means it has the least distortion of things in the pass band due to the, the uh, non-constant delay with frequency. Uh, in be the other one, uh, I know Chebyshev 2 is the one that's smooth in the pass band, but it has ripples in the stop band. So it doesn't have a nice smooth stop band. Uh, and Chebyshev type 1 is the other way around. So it has ripples in the pass band and a smooth stop band. Now these both together have about the same middle order. And in the same way, the dispersion is around the middle. It's more usually, on average, more dispersion than the Butterworth filter. 
about less than the elliptic filter. And so if I have an elliptic filter, uh, it turns out it has ripples in both the pass band and the stop band. So it, it's not very smooth in either band, but the benefit of that is it takes the lowest order, but it often has the most dispersion, the most distortion. And, and this still might not be too bad. In a lot of applications, you can live with it. And other app, but again, that's where engineering judgment comes in as to how important and how much distortion you can accept of things coming through your pass band. But again, remember, order tells us something about uh, how much computation it takes to form each output thing, right? That the order is the number of delays in the difference equation. And so the number of delays tells me how much memory I'm going to need to implement the system. And then it also, basically for every delay, we usually have a multiply and add in the block diagram or in the difference equation if I'm implementing it with something like the filter command in MATLAB. So the higher the order, the more computation it's going to take per output sample. Okay, so now if we go uh, up to the next slide, or actually I guess it's time to go to MATLAB. I'm going to show you a MATLAB example of designing a Butterworth filter. And actually before we go to MATLAB, let me uh, talk about the specification uh, we're going to look at. So this will just so you can see what the filter is. Our filter design that we're going to design, we want it from 0 out to uh, 0.2 pi. So 0.2 pi. I want it to be close to 1 between 1.01 and 0.99. I want to keep within that range out to 1. And so looking at this, this would tell me my delta 1 is 0 0.01, right? It's plus or minus 0 0.01 around the, an ideal gain of 1. And so, and then this is my omega p, this is my omega s. My stop band starts at 0.3, and when I do that, my delta 2 is 0 0.05. So those are all important things I need to know before I can go to MATLAB to design the filter. So now let me, let me show you how that works. Get that out of the way and bring my MATLAB window into view. We have, uh, you know, this, this MATLAB file, and I'll put this up on the class website too. So I define delta 1 and delta 2 to be those tolerances, 0.01 in the pass band, 0.02 in the stop band. The ripples I design, these are the ripples in dB. So it's minus 20 log of delta 2 for the stop band. Uh, the reason this one is 1 minus delta 1, let me get the, uh, get the screen back, or the specification back up here, is that this is the lower limit here. This is basically, this will always be, the, the 1 minus delta 1 will be uh, this, this lower edge here. So if I take that into dB, I say in how many dB away from 0 it is, it would be minus 20 log of 1 minus delta 1. And the minus is kind of a weird convention. They, you know, it's going to be something like the minus 1 dB or minus 0 0.05, 0 0.5 dB. And, and they just historically all the design equations were written in terms of uh, positive dB. So the people say it's half a dB below. And so there's this extra minus sign for both of them when we, when we write them in the dB terms. Uh, so you just have to live with the convention so you can use the library. I can't explain it better than that or justify it for you. But if we go back, we can see. So this is the lower edge of the pass band, RP. Lower edge of the stop band, RS, is minus 20 log base 10. Don't forget the base 10 or you'll get a bad filter of delta 2. And then I need omega P and omega S. And when I design the filter in Mat MATLAB, they're really, there's, for every type of filter, Butterworth, Chebyshev 1, Chebyshev 2, and elliptic, there's two functions that work together. Uh, one is to work out, to take the specifications, and it works out what order filter do you need to solve, to, to meet these specifications. And then the second one gives you the filter coefficients. Right, so this first one, is uh, the unfortunately named function is butord, short for Butterworth order, from the days when you could only have eight letter file names, I guess. And the first argument is the pass band frequency normalized by pi. So this should be between zero and one. Then the stop band. And then the pass band ripple in dB, stop band ripple in dB. And what I'll get back from this is n is the filter order and omega n is, is the, what's called the natural frequency of the Butterworth. I take those two arguments and I hand them to the function called butter. So I just, I use this to sort of come up with the design parameters hand those to the butter function, and the butter function will give me the B and A coefficients that I can hand to filter or freak Z or any of the other uh, pat things I want to do. If I want to apply this filter to a signal or find its impulse response, I could use B and A with the filter command, 
Uh, in this example, I've gone on to find its frequency response, so I'll just show you how it meets the specification. So I find uh, h and omega, so this is, a, this is the frequency response and at the corresponding frequencies at 2048 different frequencies uh, with b and a for the filter, and then I make a plot. I plot it first on a linear scale and then on a dB scale where I've, I've limited the axes. And then another thing that's good to prove the specifications are met is I can zoom in. I make a second set of plots where they just cover that passband region, so it goes from zero to the edge of the passband, and from one minus delta one to one plus delta one, and a similar thing on the stop band. I go from the stop band edge up to one, and from zero up to delta two on the vertical scale. And then the last one, I use the, uh, a function called PZ plot to make a pull zero diagram, and PZ plot takes the B and A, just like filter or freak Z would, so this is the numerator, this is the denominator, and makes a, a, the poles and zeros of the filter. So let me uh, run this and then I'll show you the different windows that come out of it. So for filter one, or figure one, this is just comparing, this is our classic example. So here's a, a nice flat pass band up to point two and then a nice attenuation to point three, and then it's flat after that. If I put this on a dB scale, we can see it's flat at zero dB, right? 20 log of one. 0 dB, and when I get just beyond 2, it falls off with a nice steep slope. In fact, this goes down to minus a gazillion. Uh, so I don't, I didn't, I just sort of cut it off. 80 dB down in almost any practical light engineering system is, is, is pretty good, certainly for anything that involves audio. You can rarely hear anything below that. Uh, so that's a good start. Uh, for the filter, the figure 2, let me pull that up, shows I, the same, the, the top figure there the, on the linear scale, uh, but it's only showing it in the pass band and stop band. Let me make this a little bit bigger. And so you can see this is the from 0.99 to 1.01 and from 0 to 0.2 pi. If the filter design stays within this box, it means we met the spec. And you can see that it easily does. In fact, it has some room to spare. It only goes down to 0.995 here. And the stop band, again, it starts at 0.3 pi and goes up to 1. So it's sort of like I cut out those boxes on the design spec. And this starts at 0 0.005, 5 times the 10 to the minus 3, and it just meets that at the corner, and then everything beyond that is inside it. Another interesting thing now that we know about Z transform and pole zeros is we can look at this and say, well, what order is it? In fact, I could have, I could have seen that oop, in my command window. Uh, it's a 17th order filter if I look at big N. Um, and, and then that means there's 17 poles and 17 zeros here, and you can see the poles sort of make this axis here. These are all the things holding the frequency response up. So they sort of get this arc here uh, that will go up to this, this angle will be about 2.2 pi. Then when I go beyond it, it starts falling off. And all this big pile of zeros is pulling the frequency response down, way down, uh, as I get over here towards pi. So as I drive along the ring road, right, I'd have the, the uh, I'd be up in the mountains here, which would hold my frequency response up. And these are very carefully designed to hold the, the, the frequency response uh, constantly up is the magic of the Butterworth filter. And then as I get out of the mountain, drive away from the mountains going downhill here, I'll get further and further away from these poles, which means my frequency response goes down. And as I get closer to all these zeros, it goes down even faster. So that's what gives me the behavior, if you think in terms of the material we saw with poles and zeros and the geometric interpretation. Okay, so I'm gonna stop uh, this video here. That's the Butterworth example. I'll do one more filter. Uh, one more example showing how, what happens if I design the same specification filter with the Chevy Shed filter. Okay, that's all for this video. See you next time.